Level 33 Entertainment invites viewers to spend some time with Worst Friends. Available November 4th. So they tell me on demand and DVD and all over the place, even on Direct TV. That's right. And uh, we are going to be chatting with our guest, Larry Fessenden, to talk about this new film, Worst Friends. I just have to put his old number in the... I guess what they refer to it as is what they call a dark comedy. I call it a buddy film. I guess it's also a dark comedy. Well, it's kind comedy. of a dark comedy. Yeah, it had a lot of that. Uh, what the premise of the film is, uh, two kids growing up, really good friends. They kind of separate after a long time. Kind of get back together when they're growing up by fate in the fact that the one kid is in town visiting his dad and his new young wife. Larry's the dad. And the kid gets in an auto accident. And Larry's dad, not Larry, but Larry uh, in his infinite wisdom, uh, decides to hire the old friend of the kid. To take care of him. To take care of him. Offers him, what, 500 bucks or something like that? $1,000. $1,000 to live in the house. But they found that they're not really friends anymore. Yes. And it's a very uncomfortable situation because one... One kid's smart and just not ambitious and really could have gone somewhere but didn't because he's a little lazy and, right. and doesn't really have any assurance of himself, no self-assurance. And the other kid is, is just a fuck off. <laughs> is yeah. that how you describe it? Pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, so, well, let's ask Larry how he would describe it. Let's go ahead and give our guest, Larry Fessenden, a call. Is this Larry? Yes, it's Larry. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We're very excited to welcome back a returning guest to Cult Radio Live. He is an actor and a filmmaker, and he's joining us to talk about the new film, Worst Friends. We're very excited to welcome Larry Fessenden to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hey, guys. What's going on? Exciting to be here. It's always great to have you back. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I had mentioned last time that I thought you reminded me of a pirate, but I've changed my mind <laughs> because now as I look at you, you remind me of Jack Nicholson. I've heard that before. <laughs> I heard, uh, somebody once asked me how many times I hear that, and I honestly, I think it's twice a week. Well, you Crazy. know that... I was in the airport twice, uh-huh. uh, coming and going, uh-huh. uh, the, the TSA guys. Frisking me, basically said <laughs> I look like pickles. Anyway, it's funny. I I don't. Uh, I get it. I've had it my whole life. Well, you know that's a double-edged sword because either they would let you go because they think you're Jack, or they might frisk you more if they think you're Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely double-edged. <laughs> so we're talking but about. Also, it's funny. You know, sometimes I'll be performing uh, or acting, and, and just I feel like I'm channeling Jack, and it's not what. You know, you want to be a unique uh, actor. You don't want to feel like you're stuck under a shadow. So it is, it's double-edged in many ways. But there you have it. Well, you know... I have a great kinship to him. He's always a favorite. He is. He's a great guy. And I'd, I'd rather be compared to him than somebody that can't act. So, I mean, this is not all bad. So, uh, we, were talk- right, exactly. we were talking about your brand new film, Worst Friends. Now, I was describing it as what I call a typical buddy film, but according to the press release, they call it a dark comedy. How would you describe it? Well, I think they're calling it a dark comedy because it doesn't quite have all the, the resolve and, and, you know, the Hollywood belly laughs. But, uh, I think it's a really good... Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a buddy film. It's really about these two guys, and they have this sort of slightly awkward past, and they're both sort of sociopaths. Right. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, they they kind of find their way. And uh, I think it's a really smart little indie film. I, I was very happy to be involved. We did it some years ago now. I don't know if that's clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed the guys I was working with when we made it and then it sort of uh, disappeared for a while and I was so happy they did find a release well, and I watched it a couple times since and I think it's pretty strong it I, is I it do really I like is. it you know a lot of people really expect you to be like all horror all the time do people get surprised you do films like this I'm sure they do but honestly I've done quite a few you know I try never to refuse an acting gig because it's really fun and I'm always appreciative of the people that think of me as a character actor 
and not just somebody who gets killed after two minutes on the screen, which <laughs> usually happens. But uh, so I, I I treasure these kind of uh, opportunities uh, to obviously do something a little bit broad or goofy or something. Um, and so yeah, I don't know. You know, you never know how people perceive you. I don't know why these guys thought I'd be right for the role, but they wanted me to do it. And I was happy to do it. I thought you were hilarious, uh, the character of the dad. I mean, uh, just married a young, kind of good-looking bimbo. and, and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, baby. That's why I did the role. Uh, no, I was... Uh, yeah, but he, the dad is such a jerk. It's hilarious. Um, and in a way, the whole movie is haunted by his... You can tell he raised his kid so badly yeah. that the kid is real trouble. <laughs> right. It's just a funny funny role. Really fun to do that. I, I could almost see Larry Pheasant in, in life with women hanging all over him <laughs> because, you know, I've talked around. People love you. I have never... Everybody loves Larry. I've never heard anybody <laughs> ever say anything bad about you, ever. Oh, that's sweet. Well, you should talk to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, what can I say? Well, that's a nice. I'm not going to counter that statement, so I'll let that hang and see what the uh, let the audience decide. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of that too might be uh, coming from actors and stuff, because I, I think it gives you uh, a little bit more rapport with people in knowing that you're on both sides of the camera. I mean, you're not only an actor, producer, director. Uh, you have your own production company and everything. You've done it all, so you know what it is to be an actor and, and what to go through. Well, there's no doubt about that, and I'll tell you as I direct. Uh, usually the actors get wind of the fact that I'm a, a performer and I really do know what they're going through. I find acting to be slightly torturous and yeah. it's one of the reasons I didn't just focus on that. Uh, also, I, I love all the other aspects of filmmaking, but uh, I really do have so much respect for what the actors are up to. You know, they're really putting themselves out. There's a tremendous vulnerability there's the craft of it, you know, there's just the simple reality of learning lines. And, you know, you just show up, especially with movies, there's no rehearsal. You just show up on set and you've got to know what you're doing and and fall in line. And so I always admire the people who can do that professionally. And so when I'm uh, directing or even producing, I'm just really appreciative of the people that do it well. Well, let me ask you, does it kind of go the other way? Because, of course, you can empathize with actors and, and, and things like that because you've done both sides of it. But when you're directing a film, and have you ever had an instance where an actor comes on your set and they're just completely unprepared, they don't know their lines? I would think that that would be a little bit more frustrating to somebody who is also an actor and knows what they should be doing to prepare. Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the whole business, in my opinion, of show business is is tuning into your empathy. So you're always, even as a director, when you want everything to w work well and you're wanting your team to be as sharp as possible, you can't help but be empathetic. That's part of being an artist. You're mm -hmm. sort of opening yourself up. So it's very wounding and, and scary. You start feeling sad for their dilemma. I did have this happen a couple times. Once an actor couldn't learn his lines, and I was just as tortured as him, and we sort of muddled through. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, that's the whole business of being on a set. You know, as a director, you're really there. You're kind of a caretaker. You're a cheerleader. You're a babysitter. You know, you're trying to get everybody to, you know, to get the most out of what they have, and it's Part of your job to sort of figure out how to best work with someone. Some people want to be slapped around a little. Some people want to be nurtured. Some people are nervous and be reassured. You know, this is all part of the thing. You got to really be very attuned to to your set and to each individual performer. So, you know, that's all part of the the gig. Right. But one thing I always do with actors is, if I want them to do a sex scene, I remind them that that I have done this. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, and then you can uh, tell them, listen, uh, uh, that's what I need you to do. I've been there, and so on and so on. So you always have that card to play as a director. If you've been an actor, you you can talk to them uh, as as you know where they're coming from. Right. How happy are you with, with 
who you are and what you've done because this may sound crazy. You might totally understand what I'm saying. If I was an actor and I'm not, I'm a radio guy, I think I would want to be like you because to me, a character actor is such a great thing. I wouldn't want to be... Okay, Johnny Depp used to be a character actor. Now he's this big, giant actor. I wouldn't want to achieve that height. I would I'd want to stay my life being a character actor. What about you? I mean, how does it affect you? Well, let's face it, I have no real choice anymore. But I'll tell you, the <laughs> cool thing about Johnny Depp is he's continued to be a character actor. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Even as he's a movie star, and I kind of admire that. I think he's pretty unique. I mean, the fact that he had good looks gave him sort of this edge, but he immediately put on as much makeup as he could and disguised himself from from Edward Scissor hands on. And I, I admire him. I always have for exactly that reason. He he could have been some sort of uh, you know, fey leading man, but he he really loves doing the voices and and the physical work. So that's Johnny. As for me, I mean, you know, look some of our favorite actors are clearly character actors, um, and that's just, uh, it has to do with your physique and how old you are and your looks and all that plays into it, but also your your style. Look, I love doing the accents and having a little bit of a hunchback here and there, or, <laughs> yeah. you know, club foot, all of that stuff, good fun. No. <laughs> uh, you said pirate, then you said Nicholson, I mean, <laughs> uh, that's the vibe, what, what can I tell you? Um... So, yeah, I mean, I, I love that aspect. I mean, I'm in an even more specific genre where I'm the guy who gets killed within two minutes of appearing into a film. So I don't know what... They, they don't even have a name for that. Well, I, I'll tell you, in a reference to uh, a little indie film that I think did really well, and I'm assuming it did well because we have Apple TV here and we get a screensaver. It's a screensaver of movie posters, and they really only put your, your top theatrical releases, and I was shocked to see this little film on my screensaver and it's our favorite film of the year and that's Jug Face. Ah, cool. Well, that's a great film by Chad Crawford Kinkle, a lovely director, very personal uh, genre film but really steeped in a specific history that he created, yeah. uh, sort of a southern piece and I play a, a dad with a southern accent and I'm in it with uh, Sean Young and uh yeah, that was, I mean, you know, that's a character piece. Um, that's the best kind of character acting. You're really playing. Well, I tell you, uh, it really hit home, that, home with me because, like, we lived in the South for a while. There are some people that really get into some of those crazy religions down there. Oh, definitely. Um, and that was that was the vibe. I mean, I actually made a documentary on religion, and we went and visited a lot of it, specific people, and uh, we saw the snake charmer uh churches where they're, you know, dancing with uh, snakes and fire, and uh, the point is, is it gets pretty uh, wacky, and and that's what Chad was capturing with Jugface. Yeah. In this case, they're worshipping a big giant hole with a monster in it, and making uh, pottery that has the faces of the townspeople, and if your face shows up, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head the name of the actress. I do not want to be on that jug. Right. What? The name of the actress that was the main actress, I can't think of her name right now, but she was so excellent. I mean, for like, she hadn't really done a whole lot of theatrical work, from what I understand. Lauren Ashley Carter was yeah, yeah. awesome, and yeah. we're making a movie with her as we speak. Tomorrow yeah. morning I show up on set really? with her and, and Sean. So, you know, uh, we just love making these little films and... Uh, that's what we do. Well, you tell those two ladies that I'm, I'm a big fan of Jug Face, and I look forward to the new film. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. So last time we talked to you, we were talking about Birth of the Living Dead. How did that do? Oh, I've got to tell you, it did well. It was on uh, number one here and there. I don't know what, Netflix for a while. You know, I think people love George Romero. So there's a note to self. Make a movie about somebody <laughs> that people already love. <laughs> um but it's a great story of the making of Night of the Living Dead, and uh, it's certainly streaming and available on DVD and, and really worth people's time if they like uh, low-budget movies, if they like uh, zombies. Uh, and it's a really the origin story of, uh, of the zombie movie. So that did well for us. It was made by Rob Kuhn. He was the director. I was just a, a cog in that wheel, but we had a lot of fun getting that out to right. the 
it actually it's touched massive. something in an area that a lot of people didn't talk about because uh, the other host here, who's my daughter, she has a day job too, and her boss is as big of a multi-billionaire as he is. <laughs> He's the biggest zombie fan in the world. He was talking to her. He hadn't even seen your film. He was talking about the political overtones that that may or may not have touched on, being that it came from the '60s, like it did. You mentioned that in your film. Yeah, well, that's what I think is so great about Rob's movie is that he really, uh, and it's something I. Uh, when I think about horror, I really am very aware of how important horror is as a means to discuss the national uh, anxieties that are going on at, a, at any period of history. And of course, in 1968, when Night of the Living Dead came out, we had the Vietnam War, we had race riots, uh, the whole country seemed to be falling apart, and it's reflected in the movie. There's a sense of despair, um, and that's, uh, I think that's true uh, in a lot of the different eras you know, you see giant ants after we drop the atom bomb. So I think that's what's cool is that horror is political somehow. Definitely. Uh, it reflects the, the anxieties of the time. Absolutely. Now, you were talking about kind of enjoying doing the character acting thing, and especially it's fun when you get to do the voices and stuff. Well, voice acting is something that is kin to doing radio shows. And you have something that you do that's kind of a throwback to old time radio, where you guys do tales from the pale. Now, Larry, I have to, I have to give you, I have to give you hassle here because I know you're an East Coast guy, and you rarely get out here on the West Coast. And you came out and you did at the silent movie theater in L.A. a live version of Tales from the Pale. And our friend David Dakota was invited. Where was our no, invite? It was David DeVal. Or David DeVal. Uh, Graham Skipper. Where was our invite, Larry? Oh, you know David. That's so cool. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that, and I apologize on the air. Um, but I, uh, I'm i terrible at uh, promotion. I mean, on the one hand, I'm a real huckster, and I'll promote stuff. But when it comes down to personally remembering all the people i got to bring out, you know, the thing is, putting a show like that, it's so last minute that I don't even know what I'm promoting until like the day of. And then right. I'm like, you know what? This show is actually pretty cool. Do we know anyone out here? <laughs> but it's always too late then. Yeah. So all I can say is if you'll watch our Twitter and, and our Facebook and our website, then you could have uh, found out because we do promote that way. But as far as the real outreach, you're right. It's a terrible... Uh, it's a whole, I need more interns. <laughs> yeah, and, and, just remember, I know you're, you've got a memory like me. You, you could have been a good old radio boy. <laughs> and, and, and that is, you need to remember that we have promoted probably every Glass Eye Picks production <laughs> that has ever been. Oh, I know. And I, look, it's no sign of ingratitude. Please know that. It's just like, holy smokes. Chicken with a head cut off. Right. Anyway, we did come out to L.A. Uh, I screened my old film Habit on a Monday and then on a Wednesday. We had a spectacular evening, although admittedly we were still trying to put it all together minutes before showtime. Mm -hmm. uh, but we put up three really cool audio plays. And uh, you guys know David Duval, is that true? He, yeah. He's like a walking encyclopedia of cult movies. We, yeah, we actually well, we met David through David Dakota, and David Dakota and David Duval have come here and done the show in person many times. Well, that sounds very special. I can't even tell you what I have to tell you about David Delon. <laughs> years and years ago, I, what, I made a film called Habit, and I came to L.A. to promote it, and we hooked up with something called the Dracula Society, which was David Delval and a couple of his comrades. Mm -hmm. And we went there, and it was such a memorable night that I turned it in to the radio play that we played that Wednesday. And the irony is I hadn't seen David for 20 years, and he came to the screening on Monday of the little movie, Habit, and I told him, oh my God, David, this is too crazy. I've been thinking about you for a month because I wrote this play about our night together 20 years prior. <laughs> anyway, he came to the radio shows and we all had a big laugh because there he was. I played his uh, an exaggerated version of, uh, of Deval and I had him <laughs> turn into a vampire and kill the filmmakers. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> so I take it you don't know David Dakota. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. You, but for you, all I know, he was there that night, too. I just uh, 
I mean the original night. <laughs> so, some night, some night we need to do an in-studio show here. When you're on the West Coast, we need to get you and David Dakota and David DeVal. Because the two Davids, as we refer to them, are hilarious because they're both horror movie queens. And they're hilarious <laughs> because they call, they call each other a bitch. And, and you know, it's, it's funny. It's really funny radio. I mean, they're, they're awesome. They really are. Well, that's what was so funny because it's precisely what I was playing was an old queen. And David DeVal I had to admit that it was pretty damn close to himself. I kind of outdated him. So uh, when that radio show gets released, I'll have to alert you guys because it's a, it's a real treasure. If Absolutely. you know David, you'll just laugh. Yeah. Uh, so I it says here in my notes that you've done 10 episodes. i got to imagine it's far beyond that now. How many episodes are you into on, on your OTR uh, Tales from shows? Hill. Tales from Hell. Oh, well, 10, no, 20. Oh, wow. Or 20, 21 or something. And we did 10 in studio. We did eight live, and then we've subsequently done about five more live ones. Uh, and we're putting together a season three with lots of yummy, yummy uh, guests, but I don't quite know who they are yet. <laughs> uh, we're sorting it out. But, and we'll put that out in the spring or maybe the fall. It's always very hard. Hopefully, we're making movies in the meantime. Yeah. But, well, maybe, uh, we maybe just love doing... In fact, we're recording tomorrow. Really? Oh, my team, we're, I got a note to self. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're recording, a, we're recording a studio um, production tomorrow with Angus Scrim, the great Angus Scrim. Oh, Scrimm. wow. Oh, you you got excited for a minute. I thought Peter Laurie was on the phone. I didn't know. <laughs> Well, that's another thing. That's coming another turn. <laughs> Which is exactly why you should hang out with David DeVal, because he's the master of all the voices. No, that's funny. <laughs> but yeah, no, they're, they're, they're good guys. And in this old time radio creation, maybe you've inspired some people, because we're carrying a series, uh, somebody went out and got the rights, and he's redoing the old uh, old time radio show, Suspense, and we're carrying the new episodes as well as the old. Well, aren't you a little conglomerate? That's cool. <laughs> wow, you guys got it all going on. I don't even have a ra- By the way, my radio shows have never been on the radio. Just so you know. Uh, they're really audio plays, you know, whatever they are. Well, if you ever want us to ever play one, even if for a sample, you know where we are. That would be awesome. Well, yeah. we got to work on all this. Uh, you see what I mean? We make too much crap and we don't spend enough time promoting it. So everybody the money back. <laughs> associates you with, with this film, and it was a really great little gritty film, I Sell the Dead, and everybody wants to know, is there ever going to be another one like that? Because everybody really seems to center on that one. Oh, yeah, it's one of the most beloved things we've done, mostly because it's so singular, and Glenn McQuaid is great. Well, Glenn is my partner on Tales from Beyond the Pale, so in a weird way, we continue our working relationship. Um... I mean, it's not a big secret to say that we have a sequel, we have a script, but we, you know, then it takes a lot of effort to get all those parts yeah. mm-hmm. uh, lined up. We have, uh, you know, uh, Dominic is Reddit and Anga, you know, and and, and uh, Ron, but you know, this, it's huge to get all this stuff aligned. Right, right. But there's a lot of love for that particular movie, and I'm very proud of it. It's such an odd film among all our others and nothing that you know Hollywood would ever have green lit um, and yet it's really charming and, and people love it and they tweet about it and all the rest of that absolutely well of course we want to encourage our listeners to check out worst friends uh, but before we let you go Larry there's a you're always working and I'm seeing here on your IMDB you have at least six films that are listed in post-production um so i can mention a couple of these maybe you could tell us something about them i don't know if you're allowed to uh i see something called the unlovables yeah it's funny you mentioned that's the one show that that's a um um a webisode by my dear friend Ilya chaikin she's a great director and she and i love that piece and i try to get her to let me distribute it and it's it's online. I really do recommend uh, your listeners check it out. It's sort of a oddball comedy with Kevin Corrigan in it, and um, it's incredibly charming. But she's she's just sitting on it as a as a webisode, and and so just look up Unlovables and find it 
and check it out. You know, you just actually answered a question I was going to ask you and I forgot. I appreciate you reminding me. And that is, in knowing that you're with Glass Eye Picks, have you ever worked on something with as an actor or something and, and tried really hard to say, let me distribute that for you? Yeah, I mean, well, as I say, the unload, it would have cost a little money to finish and we all wondered if that was worth the thing, but I thought it was and I would have, you see, I'm real cheap. That's my whole MO. I would have just finished it, whatever it took, and, and then try to put it out there in a more official way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I love... It's immensely charming, but anyway. I love, I love everything you do. I love everything you do. I love everything you do with Glass Eye because, uh, first of all, you got a really fucking cool, uh, your new logo is great. <laughs> and second of all, there, there's two companies that I've never seen a bad film. One is Breaking Glass and one is Glass Eye Picks. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> well, uh, and then also I'm seeing uh, We Are Still Here. That looks great. That's a horror film, right? Yes, that that is uh, just being finished, and that'll do the festival run and come out, and hopefully that will be seen. That's by Ted Gagan. It's produced uh, by Travis Stevens for uh, MPI, a company I've worked with a lot, and I was just invited to act in that, but uh, that should be uh, the real deal. That's Yeah, these movies are all just finishing post-production and looking for the, the standard festival run and, and so on. And then, of course, there is uh, Pod, which is the one that I believe you were talking about with Lauren Ashley Carter. Yes, but actually, uh, Pod is by Mickey Keating. Now, Mickey is an amazingly up-and-coming director. He was an intern at Glass Eye, and we've now made... uh, He's made three movies, and the movie that I mentioned that we're shooting tomorrow is Mickey's next movie with Lauren again, you see, so... Uh, that's very exciting. So Pod will come out, and then the one we're shooting now is is already uh, in the works. Well, Tiffany will uh, text you our contact information unless you can get it from the publicist. I would really appreciate it if you could have Lauren get a hold of me. I would love to have her on the show. I think she's awesome. Oh, Dynamite. I would have... Well, she'd be uh, great to talk to. She's starting her own company, so she's got a lot of juice on her own, let alone what she's done with Nikki. I, yeah, so, I think, I think uh, she's, she's gonna totally cool. definitely. She's gonna be somebody that she's gonna be a force to reckon with later on. She really, she really got talent like just above and yeah, beyond. exactly, definitely. All right, well, uh, I know that you have a movie and a radio play to both do tomorrow, so I don't want to keep you up too late. Um, before we go, though, <laughs> I really appreciate that you actually uh, remember. That's exactly what I have. I do have too much to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's but be- exactly right. Before oh my we, God! Before we go, let our listeners know uh, where they can keep track of everything you're doing. If you have a website, Facebook, Twitter, all that kind of good stuff. Well, I'm old fashioned, so I would just say go to glasseyepicks dot com, G L A S S E Y E P I X, and then we have a Facebook presence and Tumblr and Twitter and Instagram and all that crap. But basically, it's all living on uh, glasseyepicks dot com. You could explore that for hours if you were I'm really a loser <laughs> so just let me ask you where did you come up with the name glass eye picks you, you don't have a glass eye right <laughs> no but I wear a glass eye ring okay uh, you know a friend of mine gave me a glass eye years ago and said this is because you're a visionary guy but it's also to me the, the glass eye of the camera lens and uh, uh, I don't know it, it has all the right uh, qualities and Pix P I X that comes from an old Cagney movie. In the yeah. old days, Variety used to uh, talk in kind of this strange, coded, poetic language. Pix mm-hmm. makes six Pix. Uh, I, I was just thinking. Gla- I was so just, it's sort of a tribute to that. I was just thinking Glass Eye because I kept thinking of you as a pirate in the beginning. <laughs> so I, I don't know. But, wh- but what hey, man, you know the thing that's beautiful about the art? It's all open to interpretation. That's right. So you see exactly what you want in that name, and that's perfect. And, and one thing I will say, and that is whether you look like a pirate or whether you look like Jack Nicholson, <laughs> you're, you're one fucking hell of an actor. You really are. You're a damn good actor. Oh, thanks, man. That's very sweet. Well, cool. I love it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we encourage our listeners. Fact, I'll take it even like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> we encourage our listeners to head over to glasseyepicks.com and also make sure to check out the feature film Worst Friends. It was out uh, available on video on demand and DVD as of November 4th. And Larry, as always, it's been uh, so much fun to have you on the show and uh, have a good rest of the weekend even though you're going to be working 
I am going to be working, but i am uh, got a little kick in my step talking to you guys, so thanks so much. <laughs> great time. Absolutely. Thank you, Larry. Have a great rest of the weekend. Bye. All right. You too. All Bye. Right.